not sufficiently cared for my own mental health in the past, gotten into a bad place, had to go on mental health leave, you know, work hard on something that is awesome and meaningful to them, they're also going to want to be able to live good lives. So it goes back to like the fundamental question of like, what is success of the organization and how do people play into that? Welcome everyone to our Tech Minds Unwind series. My name is Pradeep Raval and I work in tech in the Silicon Valley. In this episode, we'll be joined by Newton Chen, who is the Director of Health and Performance at Google. He's been at Google for the past 15 years and has always served the employees at Google in various capacities. So, hey Newton, I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here, Vidi. Yeah. Can you tell us about your work? at Google and what is it that you do? So as director of health and performance, my team oversees a suite of health and well-being amenities, both on-site and digital at Google. And so those are things such as a global network of gyms distributed at our offices around the world, our on-site massage program, our sports, dance, group exercise programs, and then a suite of other things such as health promotion events, community-centered events, and we also have our digital fitness streaming platform so that we can reach Google employees both in their homes, on the go, or with hybrid experiences that happen in the office as well. My other half of the job is to coordinate with many of the other teams that touch the health and well-being of Google employees across our company, such as our benefits department, people development, Google Health, employee health and safety, so that we are continually aligning and driving a holistic strategy around health and well-being across all of these teams. My, my, that, that sounds like a lot. How do you juggle through all of these? at once at your job today? You could question whether I'm doing it well or not. It is a lot. And I always feel like I'm behind. Uh, my performance reviews are, are decent. So I, I think I'm keeping up enough. But it's if you think about health and well-being, it's, it's this incredibly complex problem. So one of the mindsets are not, not problems, but it's an incredibly complex topic. So if you're going to work on something like that, it's never going to be done. And so you have to get into this mindset of, like, yes, even though I want to push and I want to I really want to make things better for people, I need to follow a process of like, how are we making continual progress around making things better and better for people while also balancing this like weird tension of it's never going to feel completely solved because it's a complex problem. And that takes a lot of self-management. Yeah. Okay. Sounds, sounds like it. I, I It sounds like a very complex problem and which is why I'm going to get into a more complex question, which is how do you balance between profitability and well-being? So it touches to the points that you mentioned, but like more so about, I know that Zuckerberg said that this year is the year of efficiency, which means that given the economy, companies in the Valley are like pushing to get more out of their employees. And then how do you handle this being a well-being director, which needs constant work? and a director in this complicated landscape. I, I think the important context to consider is for people who work in a role like mine, where we work as part of a larger organization, the bottom line is that the organization has to be successful or none of this really matters. Because if the organization isn't successful, then we don't have a role to do. So it goes back to like the fundamental question of like, what is success of the organization? And how do people play into that? And then how does your philosophy around people, like how is that centered around their health and well-being? So for something like a Google or a Meta or an Apple, where they want to attract the best of the best, if you think about this, like, yes, for, for these companies to continue to be competitive in today's like incredibly dynamic environment, they're going to have to attract the best of the best. What are the expectations of the best of the best? Yes, they're going to want to, you know, work hard on something that is awesome and meaningful to them. They're also going to want to be able to live good lives. And in order for them to do that, they're going to have to, they're going to want to maintain some level of good health and well-being. And that is both, you know, something that is good for them, but also good for the company because health and well-being and productivity and performance are definitely linked. So it, it's all about what is your model of what makes this organization successful? What is the people strategy? And then how does health and well-being play into the larger people strategy? Gotcha. And I believe all of this keeps changing as times move, as situations change. So it's like constantly keeping up to all of these changes and redefining them. Yeah. I, I think the, the, the thing that a lot of people, it's difficult to think about because we're going through a, a really challenging time, but the company, if it keeps like one way of doing things around its people strategy, but the external environment 
changes dramatically, like the um, the economic outlook for the world, but your company doesn't adjust, your company isn't going to be successful. Now, you could argue over the details of that, um, but I think that's something that we need to acknowledge. And therefore, you know, for the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, they have to make some really difficult choices. Okay. So I think moving on to the wave of that, right now working in tech is not easy at all. It's complicated because the economy is complicated. There have been a lot of layoffs. It's And it's always been difficult to find balance when there's a hefty paycheck on the other end. And, you know, promotions that reward additional hard work, which means that people in tech work between like 18 to 20 hours sometimes in a day to just complete their project so that they can get the next promotion. So in this environment and the way things are motivated, why should someone in tech even want to focus on their mental health? Or why should they be focusing on it at all? I would argue that an environment like tech, it becomes even more essential to focus on your mental health. So the analogy that I use a lot is, let's say you join something like an Apple. An Apple is a multi-trillion dollar company that still seeks to grow and to provide amazing products at even larger and even more grand scale. So take a step back and think about, you have a company that big, that successful, that is trying to do even more. If you go work for that company, is it logical to think that the demands might be really, really high? I think it is completely logical to think that. Like the analogy I use a lot is like, you didn't join the local softball league. You intentionally decided to try out for and join the New York Yankees. Or um, I don't know, I, all my sports analogies are very US centric. So I can't think of a good uh, uh, football team like using the international term for football. Let's acknowledge that that's the environment you've stepped into. Therefore, it's going to, the, the demands are going to be very high. In order for you to be successful in that, your mental health is going to be extremely challenged. You're going to have stress. You're going to have uh, situations where all your coworkers are amazingly talented and you're asking like, am I as talented? Can I keep up? And at the same time, you're probably juggling an outside life. Maybe you have family, maybe you have kids. And so if you're not thinking about your mental health, I think you're putting yourself at risk of running into problems with you know, depression, anxiety, or worse. So in my mind, uh, these things go completely hand in hand. And how would you say that someone in tech can actually focus on these things at this point, at this critical stage in time? I think there's, there's a few things. One is for, uh, I'll, I'll speak from personal experience as someone who has not sufficiently cared for my own mental health in the past, gotten into a bad place, had to go on mental health leave. And now I'm coming back and I'm having to re-engineer my life to better accommodate my mental health. I think step one is you need to get very, very clear on what you want and why. And that's not just at work, but I would zoom that out to like, hey, you're you're not, there's not a, a work self and another self. Like they're integrated, they're one being, even though sometimes we try to keep them silent. So what I would ask, or the question I like to ask people is, what type of life do you want to build? Work is a component of that. Family is a component of that. Your passions are a component of that. So what type of life do you want to build? And if you can start to get clear on that and the priorities around it, then you can start to figure out like, okay, and how do I want to show up in each part? So for example, for me, I know that the parts of my life are husband and father, competitive athlete, and then leader in the workplace. And I list those specifically in that order because that's the order priority. My role as a husband and father, that's most important. Competitive athlete, that's a personal passion that's really important to me and actually fuels me across the other buckets and helps me maintain my physical health. And then leader in the workplace, uh, the work that we do around health and well-being is personally very purposeful and meaningful to me. Like that's the change I want to drive in the world. And so if I can hold on to those things really tightly, and then I look at at work, all the stresses that come, there's a lot of things that are great opportunities for me to say further that mission. There are other things that maybe they don't align with my mission, but it's what the company needs from me. And for me to be in integrity with my values, I have to deliver a good job. And I will do that. And then there are those opportunities where the old Newton might have said, well, this looks like a great opportunity to advance my career. I should say yes to this. Today, I'm much more discerning where I might say, does this help me be a better husband and father? Does it help me become a better competitive athlete? Does it further my mission as a leader in the workplace around health and well-being? And if it's a no or it's a, a maybe, then we're not going to do it. And that has been incredibly clarifying. 
So that's the first thing is to just be, get yourself clarity about where you want to spend your, your energy and not. The other side of it is to have a really clear picture of what actually replenishes you. So for all of us, there's the basics like exercise, sleep, good nutrition, meaningful social connections, and then hopefully some connection with something that's meaningful or purposeful to you that is greater than you or greater than all of us. If you can check those boxes, then on top of that, you can start to figure out like, and what specifically, how does that specifically look for me? And if you're going to build life where you have those two things, you have clarity around what you want, you have clarity around what replenishes you, you have a really good shot at nurturing your mental health, even in stressful roles at a tech company or beyond. Yeah, you mentioned very powerful things. I'm curious about how you do it yourself, because you said there is nurturing yourself which also needs some time and then there are three different roles that you play for yourself as a husband as a power lifter and as a father as well and then also as a leader so how do you find the time to balance all of these together and stay sane so i think of this as there, there's a few things again going back to priorities that i anchor to and i invest as heavily as i can in those and it kind of squeezes out all the other stuff that would eat at my time so again husband and father my partner and i we actually work on a family charter where we say hey what vision do we have for this family and therefore how do we show up for each other day to day on a week basis on a month basis and that's something we continue to develop, but at least now we have, you know, I don't want to turn my, my family life into a checklist, but at least we have the things where we, we're on the same page of like, Hey, if we show up for each other in these ways, that's most important for the competitive powerlifting. Interestingly, after a mental health leave, you might have said like, do you need to decelerate on that? I actually said, you know what? I'm going to go for even bigger championships. And there was a reason for that. As I went on mental health leave, I had to really examine deeply like what parts of me are achievement driven because of how I've been socialized because of how I've been traumatized or, or things that I'm just picking up like by comparison from working at a high performing tech company or, or in a culture like in Silicon Valley. However, once I was able to see that I could also examine and what parts of you are achievement driven because that's really who you are. And what I found was there was a part of me that it really wanted to run fast in competitive powerlifting. Like it wanted to see how far can we take this? And so I started pursuing like an even more difficult championship than I had won in the past. And what happened then was once I knew what I had to do there, it became very clear. Like I had to do some things that were really difficult and painful in terms of training, nutrition, sleep and recovery. It became a math problem of like, okay, well you have that, you have your family responsibilities, you have your core work responsibilities. Now you know exactly how much time and energy you have left. And everything you say yes to is going to detract from one of these. Is it worth it? And so I think by installing those big pieces, I became much more discerning about all the small pieces that came along. Now, before my mental health leave, what happened was I had some of those in place, but instead what so many opportunities come through like a dynamic tech company like Google. Like there's so many interesting things you could work on. And I would, you know, say yes to too many things that might've just caught my attention and seemed like, oh, that was bright and shiny and cool. Like we should do that too. Like it'll be good for the team. It'll be interesting, fun, could be good for my career. But now that I had those big rocks in place and I had committed to really big goals in them, a lot of that other stuff like it just became clear that it had to be a no. Yeah, I appreciate all the examples and I'm, the fact that you went deeper into how you balance everything together. And you also mentioned your mental health. Leave. So let's go deeper into that. Like what exactly happened and then how did you recover from that mental health leave and what all did you learn? Because it seems like you gained a lot of awareness through that leave. I went on mental health leave in January of 2022. So we're approaching almost two years since that time. And that's given me some time to reflect and see, like there, there were actually a few phases I went through on mental health leave and even before mental health leave. And so there's, there's five R's I refer to now with, with these phases. The first one is retreat. And this is not really a very palatable term to an audience of high performing tech professionals like retreat. It sounds cowardly. But that was an acknowledgement from me that yes, I was definitely burning out. My therapist had given me a lot of warning of, I think you should take leave. If you take leave now, it might be shorter. If you wait, you might be able to work through this and stay at work and be okay. But there's also a chance that you'll end up in a much worse place 
and on a much longer leave. And so retreat for me was actually, it was a planned retreat from work, knowing that, okay, if this these are the potential outcomes, according to my therapist, to me, it felt like the responsible thing to do was let my manager know, say, this is a really difficult choice, but I'm going to take this leave. And then I planned out here's when I, I'd like to do it. Here's how I see it working in terms of me stepping out of my role and how it would continue to get covered. And here's my best guess at how long I would be out, but there are no guarantees. So that was the first thing. It was like, I knew I needed to retreat from the environment in which I was burning out. And luckily, thank you to, to my therapist and my friends who had also been on leave before who gave me advice. I had enough foresight to know like I should do this now. The next thing, the next R is reset. And so reset, what happened was people told me, hey, once you go on leave, take at least two weeks of doing nothing. And what you'll find is the noise in your brain will start to settle down. And then you're going to be able to hear your own thoughts again. I didn't believe them because work in the field of health and well-being and have a lot of expertise. So I tried to do like all of the self-healing and recovery exercises at once and do them in a regimented program every day. And because I did that, it didn't take two weeks. It took three weeks for my brain to settle down because I had essentially created myself a new job around all these self-healing techniques. And so after about three days of that, I realized, okay, this isn't working. It's driving my anxiety up even higher. Let's shrink this list. All I'm going to do is exercise, journal, parent, and, and meditate. And everything else, like the day will be open. Once I did that, my brain did start to settle down. And then after, by the time we were through about week three, the noise in my brain had dropped enough that I could now recognize, oh, a lot of the anxiety and racing thoughts. That was just noise and it's gone now. But what I can hear are things that I think are more actually me. It's like, I think that's actually the real Newton and I haven't been able to hear him for years because everything was so noisy with anxiety. So that's phase two is reset. Phase three was reconnect, where for me, what that meant was I actually started to spend some time with some key friends from my past who knew me much earlier, say childhood or up through my twenties. And that was like kind of going through a time machine and reconnecting with like, well, who was Newton before he had all these achievements and had built up his resume? Like, what was he dreaming about? What did he love? What was he passionate about? And I could start to reconnect with that and start to see like, oh, that's me. Or a lot of that is still me. And it's independent of whatever, whatever path my career might have gone on. And I kept following because the trajectory was good. So let's see. So, so far we have retreat, reset, reconnect. The next one was reimagine. Where at the end of my mental health leave, we had the good fortune of getting matched for our uh, to be to adopt our second daughter. And so I went from mental health leave straight to new parent leave. And that was like this crash course in practicing all of these new behaviors and mindsets that I've been working on through mental health leave because the stakes were so real. Like you have a second daughter, you have a second shot at building the life that you want around your family. And so that was where the stage that I'm in that continues, I call rebuild, husband and father, competitive athlete and leader in the workplace. But I needed to get really specific about how do you want to prioritize these? How do you want to work through it when these things conflict? Uh, how are you going to stick to your values when there's a lot coming at you? And so that's the fourth stage was reimagine. And now the stage that I'm in that continues, I call rebuild, where I have, I've been able to reset, I've been able to re connect with who I think I am. I've been able to reimagine the system and the priorities I want around my life. And now that I have clarity around where I want to invest energy and where I don't, I'm rebuilding. And that's not just like a gradual process. What I'm finding is I can pour a lot of time and energy into things I said, yes, these are priorities. Because now I can say very clearly no to the things that are not on the priority list. And so the more I practice it, the more uh, those boundaries solidify, the more I learn about what I really want. And so that journey continues, but it's been extremely positive. And on the one hand, it might result in, I take on fewer side projects at work. On the other hand, it might be things like I pursue much bigger things, such as the recent national powerlifting championship that oh, I won. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your wholesome journey. It definitely sounds difficult, but it sounds very wholesome. I was especially, I connect in a way because I struggle with anxiety too. So when you mentioned about the noise suddenly going out and then you being able to listen to yourself and then reconnecting with friends. All of that makes so much sense. I think I have a question on after the leave, how did you come back to work and then make sure that those stay aligned forever? Um, they will not stay aligned forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a continual yeah. negotiation process. 
And so again, having that clarity is about what, what are my priorities is key. Now, step two is I think communicating those to my manager. And so when I came back, um, I was pretty clear about, Hey, these are my priorities. I understand you need these things for me and here's how you're going to get them. And then for all the other stuff, I will say no, unless you say, this is your job. I really need you to do this. I'm taking the paycheck. So yeah, you're right. It is my job. And as long as I'm taking the paycheck, I'll find a way to get it done. Now, my boss and I, once we had that laid out, we've never ended up at like some adversarial conflict where we couldn't resolve it. Because the fact of the matter is before this, like I was a very good employee. And just because I went on mental health leave and I rethought my priorities, it doesn't mean that I suddenly turned into not a hard worker. That, that's who I am. I am a hard worker. And so he's still getting plenty of the value that he needs out of me. I'm probably showing up with more energy on some key projects and I'm showing up with more energy for the things that are important to me. Yeah. That also sounds like a very nice boss. He is great. I, I think there's two things. One, he is very direct, which I appreciate. It doesn't work for everyone, but um, it works really well for me because we can just put everything on the table. And I'm similar. I've, I've worked on becoming more direct. And so if there's someone who I know is on the same page, I can be very direct. So we can just be very black and white about these things. Yeah. Okay. That, that sounds like a good relationship, but I'm not sure if I can always handle a manager who would be too direct. But I'm glad that's working for you. And and I think I'll, I'm glad. I'll quickly jump on to the next question, which is about, we've spoken about how things at work can function with mental health. And I think a few things I see in tech is that people still hesitate to say that they're taking a mental health leave or they're even taking a mental health day. People still call it as PTO. So it's not very normalized in the industry. And I wanted to know your thoughts on that and the systemic shifts that need to be made within organizations to actually support this. So just want to get your perspective. So one of the things I want to point out is like you, you frame this as like, this is in tech. Some of these things are not normalized. As I've gotten out there and told my story around mental health, I've connected with many people who work outside tech. While it's not normalized in tech, I would say based on what I see, it's a best case scenario in tech where it is the most normalized in tech, even though it, I wouldn't still call it normalized. So it's not a tech problem. It's a societal problem. Now, in terms of normalization, um, there is no easy answer to that. So I think for, for me personally, one of the reasons that I've been telling my story is that when I was coming back from leave, I knew how many other people were suffering. And I know that in a few ways. One is because of the role I do at Google, I see a lot of data, both internally and externally. Um, two, uh, I, I'm familiar with the research. And then three, because a lot of people knew that I was struggling. They were reaching out to me and sharing their struggles too. And so whether it's anecdotal, research-based, internal, external to Google, all the data lines up to show, hey, lots of people are struggling. So coming back from work, what I said is that knowing how many people were struggling, what is the right thing to do as a leader? And it felt like for me, the right thing to do, despite any stigma, was to share my story to at least provide one data point that starts to normalize, hey, it's okay to struggle. It's okay to talk about these things. In fact, we should be talking about these things. And I said, as long as people will invite me to speak and people are willing to listen, I'll keep telling my story for at least 12 months. That was in May, 2022. We're now in October, 2023, and I have speaking gigs all the way through end of 2023. So there's just this hunger to have this conversation. Like we made it way past 12 months and it's not slowing down. So that's one thing. That's how I am trying to normalize it. It's like, I will provide you one full color data point about what this looks like and why we need to talk about it. The other thing I would offer now is if I'm a leader in the workplace and I look at the data, it becomes very difficult to not acknowledge mental health is a problem. And if we don't do something about it, it's going to undercut the productivity and our ability to be successful as an organization. Like I can, I can put aside all the feel good care for the people opinions and just look at like, even if I wanted to look at this strictly through a cold business lens, which I do not recommend, but even if I did that, I still think you need to address this. And so if that is really what you need to do, then I would look at leaders and say, 
yes, you can, you can st- do things like offer services around mental health to better support mental health, but there's also a stigma and a cultural problem. And so much of that, like we pick up our culture and what is okay in organization by queuing off our leaders. So how do you want to show up as a leader in this moment, knowing that people are queuing off of you in a time when we need to destigmatize mental health and we need to normalize things like taking time for yourself, whether it's a mental health day, PTO, or some other type of self-care. Okay, that's powerful. I, I hope... I wish you luck in this journey. And I I mean, I saw your journey on LinkedIn and that's how we got connected too. So yeah, kudos to you for sharing that. Because LinkedIn is a brave platform where people talk about their professional achievements and nobody really talks about mental health. So thank you for sharing your journey there. I think now I have just the last question for you, which might be a bit philosophical, but it touches on this point of something which is common in tech, which is we treat productivity as the golden metric of success in today's day and age. Do you think there is going to be a wrap around that to also allow mental health? Because it's contradictory, right? Like mental health certainly does not mean always being productive. It kind of helps you be productive. So, yeah. I would say in today, I I don't know that I agree with the premise of the question in that most organizations that I know that are trying to think very carefully about um, what we're facing right now is they're they're not looking at like the one golden metric aside from profitability, because if you're not profitable, then your your company is you know going to close. But th- what I see more companies doing is they're considering a bunch of, um, you know, output metrics such as things like profitability, but then like what are the leading indicators of that? And so like, yes, you need to find ways to measure productivity because you need your organization to thrive. It will thrive if people are productive. But what I see evolving is what are the things needed to help people be productive? You need to get good talent. You need to keep that talent. And while they're with you, you need to enable them to grow and to thrive. And that's really those things I just laid out there. Get good talent, keep them, and enable them to grow and thrive very hard to argue with. So if now we start to look at what is needed for people to grow and to thrive, I think nurturing their mental health, especially looking at the data right now, it's obvious. I don't think anyone is arguing about that anymore. Like I find very few people who says, I I don't believe in this mental health thing, especially those who lead organizations and see this data. All the conversation now is how do we make this better? And that is a really difficult thing to solve. And it doesn't feel like progress because the problem is still there and it's growing, but we are actually talking about it now. And so that is the win that I will take. Awesome. Yeah. I I am glad that that's the case it is. And with that, I think the last question is, do you have anything else that you want to tell people in tech or any other questions for me? I think I've given some strong nudges to leaders and how I think they need to show up in this time around where we're all facing a mental health epidemic. Um, you ultimately, you have to choose what's right for you, for your family. Um, and I would ask you like, yes, look at your values. But if you are in a position, especially one of, of leadership that comes with power and privilege, if you look back at your career and know that we face this, um, rising issue around mental health and you got to tell your kids or your grandkids, how did you show up in this time? I hope you'll really think about that and think about what do you want to tell them? And I hope you're going to choose something that's going to make them really, really proud. Because that's what I'm trying to do for my daughter uh, or for my daughters and, you know, for the next generation that comes after them. And I ask for you, like, again, if you are a leader, especially one with power and privilege, reflect on that really heavily and then choose what's right. Oh, that was awesome. And that was very powerful. So with that, thank you, Newton, for your time. And thank you for prioritizing this podcast and the work I'm trying to do for you. Thank you for the opportunity. Really good to meet you. Uh, really good to speak with you.